You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Sandra Gowdy is a former National Party MP and former Mayor of Thames Coromandel District Council. In the past, she has fought for local residents in Wangamata and stood strong against a concerted attack by media on her stance against COVID vaccines. Before we get to our interview, here is a little taste of Sandra up against pesky, rude and annoying stuff journalists. I just have a personal choice not to take the Pfizer and I'd, I'd really like the opportunity to be able to take the Novavax. Why though? It's my personal choice. Oh, absolutely, no one's denying that. But oh, yeah, they are actually. Are they? Yeah, so expressing a personal view and a personal choice, uh, we're, I'm being vilified for it. As a community leader, though, shouldn't you, shouldn't you be setting an example? That's what a lot of people are saying, that you should be setting an example to others as a leader, as a community leader. Well, I am. You're setting an example I'm se- of don't... No, no, I'm setting an example of supporting freedom and choice. That's, my, that's what I'm... My leadership is that paradigm. I'm supporting freedom and choice and people's ability to have the right to choose. Sandra Gowdy, welcome to The Crunch. Thank you, Cam. Now, you, you're, you know, not one to shy away from controversy, are you, Sandra? Well, n- not at all. I mean, I, I don't mind um, having interactions with people no matter what the situation. Well, you've caused a, a little bit of um, ruckus in your political life. I well remember you uh, participating in a protest clearing mangroves in, in the Wangamata Harbour um, shortly after you were re-elected in the 2005 election. That's been one of the most biggest debacles and um, complete betrayal of a community that I've ever seen a regional council indulge in. And so um, naturally I rose to the fore and supported that community that in the majority wanted to do what they were doing. And the interesting thing was I think the big catalyst was a herald photograph of me wielding a chainsaw, which was absolutely magnificent, and I it was brilliant. And, you know, I still don't know how to use a chainsaw. Yeah, but everyone thinks you know how to use a chainsaw, <laughs> and they certainly <laughs> think is... that you know how to get rid of mangroves. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's only one way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they're horrible things. Well, they're, they're just a weed, And the thing is, we've got plenty of them, so I don't see any reason why the community couldn't have back the harbour amenity that it used to have, because, of course, the mangroves weren't there in the 40s. They weren't there. They just float in on the tide, and then, hello, and and then you get all the greeny nutters out there um, all of a sudden wanting to protect it because there's a little snail attached to it or something like that. Well, Well, the irony for me is how can anyone claim it's, part of their taonga when it didn't exist there previously. So it goes to show the sort of specious arguments that people use. (laughs) Definitely. Speaking of specious arguments, you stood your ground in the face of, well, what was really only media attention when you said you weren't going to get vaccinated and especially not the Pfizer vaccine. In hindsight, you were dead right, weren't you? Uh, For myself, I was dead right. I can't, and that's the interesting thing. Mm. So if the media had done their homework, they would have seen that I had a photograph that was in the front page of the local paper having a flu vaccination the year before. Um, But they tried to make out that I was anti-vaccination, and I wasn't. The difference was that I did my homework on what they were wanting to persuade me to put into my body, and I said no. I wouldn't say why I said no, because it was up to me, it was my personal choice. And if I had said anything about why I chose to go down the path I did, they would have then accused me of trying to persuade people which and, and not allow them to have the freedom of choice, to make their own choices. And I didn't want to go down that path. And And what concerned me about the Therapeutic Products Bill, which has just been passed Mm. uh, under urgency with the support of the Greens, and that's the Greens flying in the face of everything they used to hold dear. Um, I think they've seriously lost their way. But um, they're in there. If you verbally criticise a therapeutic product, which vaccines are a part of, Mm. um, you can be taken to task. And I'm not sure whether they've changed the definition for tampering or not, but as it stood... 
a public criticism of a therapeutic product can get you a fine of up to two million and a conviction. It's just ridiculous. You know, well, it so, is. But so if you say of- if you, so, if you say something like uh, our vitamin C is overrated, da 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 da, somebody could complain and you could get fined for saying that. Well, if I made a uh, yes, that's right. Potentially, so if I if I publicly criticised Pfizer, mm. I think they'd be down on me like a ton of bricks. But I'm not sure what the state of the actual wording is now of the of the act because it's been passed. I would have to go and check that because I certainly raised it in my submission. And fortunately, they did accept my submission. They didn't exclude it because they might have thought I was a conspiracy theorist or it was inflammatory, racist, or whatever other excuse I'll use to block submissions these days because that's that's what they're doing apparently. Well... This whole debacle over COVID-19 vaccinations, you, you were attacked by the pink wall Russ, uh, Susie Wiles, and also criticised by Chris Hipkins in a, in a media conference. Uh, and do you know what I said, Cam? Tell me. Bring it on, baby. <laughs> do your worst because, you know, like they just didn't do their homework. Well, that's the it's thing, isn't it? Their homework was out there to be done by people. You know, I looked up. You know, I've got a group of mates. We we didn't sort of follow the rules with lockdowns. Every Monday we'd have lunch at um, you know one of our mates' places. Um, we all came to an independent view that uh, whilst we'd all had you know multiple vaccinations for things like well, I've travelled around Asia, so I've had diphtheria and cholera and all my childhood vaccinations and everything like that. We all came to an independent view that this one. This one was not for us because we all found information on reputable pl- sites, you know, peer reviewed, all of that sort of thing to say, yeah, be very careful about this mRNA. And so we made a decision not to do it. Sounds like you did exactly the same, went through the what, same process. What, what concerns me in this whole deal, though, if, if we get too sidetracked on COVID and all the minutiae of COVID, yeah. what we lose sight of is the fundamental principle of the right to choose, the freedom yes. to have the right to choose. And that is, was was the key premise of my standing up. And I didn't care about how much they wanted to al- annihilate or attack me in the media. I was comfortable about the position I'd taken because it was my right to choose just as it is every other individual's right to choose. And I'm really concerned for the future that – our right to choose isn't constantly protected by our political representatives. And I think that's incredibly important. Our rights and freedoms must be protected at all costs. 100%. And, you know, all kudos to you for standing strong because there's a lot of people that could have taken the same stance as you, but they went along to get along. And I see that as the one takeaway from the whole pandemic, you know, shamozzle is that Kiwis rolled over and said, tickle my tummy, and if it's the government tickling it, it's really well, delightful. T- look, some did, some did, Cam, but so many were put into a position where they were just, at their livelihoods were at risk, their families were at risk from from um, not having an income, that they would lose their jobs, that you know they couldn't go and visit their loved ones. There were so many impacts that people that did take the vaccine felt they were being blackmailed or forced or coerced into doing it against their will, but they did it anyway. I mean, I know one woman that cried for three days because Mm. she had to take the vaccine to be able to keep her job. And the terrible thing was is that it was against the Bill of Rights. It was against the Bill of Rights Act that gives you the choice to say, no, I don't want that medical procedure. But, But I think that's what's coming down the track. I think we're going to be penalised for, for having exercising our right to choose and choosing not to do something, I think in the future they'll they'll shut the door on, on privileges for These aren't privileges, people. these are rights. Well, I agree, yeah, yeah. but I, I think that we're going to be penalised for it. They're going to allow you the right to choose on the one hand and then penalise you for making a choice on the other. Well, that's exactly what Arden did, and she even laughed about it. You know, when she was yeah. inter- interviewed by the Herald, and they said, well, "Aren't you creating 
know, a two-tier society. Uh, and she just giggled and said, yeah, that is what it is. Um, I think it's terrible. It's tragic, really. Absolutely tragic. Well, I'm, I'm glad that she's um, departed the political scene. I just wish the media would stop talking to her. So um, I think getting back to it then, that, uh, the, I just go back to what I said before. We, we have to make sure that our political representatives are defending our f- rights and freedoms without penalty. Which then brings me to your article that you wrote on Muriel Newman's website about the, you call it giveaway votes. Other people I do, might, might I th- call I think, it wasted votes, but a giveaway. Tell, let's just explore that a little bit. Well, I mean, every, a number of people knew that this happened. And I, one of the people that um, I, I respect greatly is a person called Lindsay Tish, who was also in Parliament and was a Speaker of the House. And yeah, I know Lindsay well. And he was right across this. He fully understood it. But when you try and put it into a way in which you're trying to convey it to other people so they can understand it, it's very, very difficult. Finally, because of this year's election and the importance of it, I decided that I'd give it a go. And I used the last election as a, as a way of giving an example that people could understand. And, um, and I, think it's, I think it's clarified it quite clearly for people that when they do vote for a minor party that doesn't get above the 5% threshold, that vote is reallocated to the successful parties. And if I remember correctly, I think the Greens only got something like half a person for the 2020, and I, I'm not sure whether they actually got a seat or not. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure they did, but it's a convoluted recipe. But what I try to do to educate people is say, if you're going to vote for XYZ party, let's not use any current ones, but let's say you're going to vote for XYZ party and they they don't uh, make the 5% threshold and they don't win an electorate seat, then the total number of votes that that party gathered will essentially be passed on using this convoluted, you know, mathematical calculation. But by and large, the majority of those votes get reallocated to the Labour Party or the National Party because they're the two biggest parties. So statistically, they're going to get more of those votes. And then I say to them, is that what you want to have happen with your vote? Do you want to give your vote to the National Party or the Labour Party. And that's when they wake up and realise things are not as they seem. That's right. And so it was 7.9% of the vote in 2020. That yep. equated to 225,182 votes that got reallocated with Labour then gaining five seats, National gained three. And so uh, I think people would be horrified to know that when they cast their vote for a minor party, their their vote potentially made it happen that um, that Labor got those extra five seats. Yeah, get, get, get extra five seats, get extra MPs, and your vote that you thought you were casting in with a good conscience has essentially been by the system reallocated to somebody that you would never have voted for in a million years. You know the worst thing about all this, Cam is yep. that nobody knows. Well, you'd think after 30 years of MMP that we would have worked it out, but I find, like you, that there's an awful lot of people who don't know this. That's right. And so um, I went to the Electoral Commission website, and I, I tell you what, it's virtually impossible to work it out. And so I sat down with somebody that's a very clever young man, and he graciously took me through it. And and I think it was the example of the 2020 election that, that um, really clarified it so well. Yeah. And um, I appreciate the fact that that young man told me. But if anybody goes to try and hunt for it through the Electoral Commission or even asks what happens to the disallowed votes or discarded votes, they don't actually tell you because they, they don't understand it themselves. Well, and, and if you've got a system that people don't understand, then the system can be taken advantage of. That's right. And so, um, but I I just think a lot of it's just sheer ignorance and people bluff their way through it. It's a bit like the treaty principles, same same thing. Nobody knows what the principles are, but they're they're just bluffing their way through it, a bit like the electoral review panel 
that that tried to um, say that, oh, well, we've got the guidelines, but actually, how can you have some guidelines if you don't have any principles? And so, again, it's a case of people actually not having the information, not understanding it, uh, and trying to bluff their way through. Well, the whole electoral system I've been talking about for, well, for as long as I've been talking about politics, which is pretty much most of my life. But I've watched, we've got rules and we've got regulations and we've got laws that say you can act in certain ways during elections. And every election, we see politicians breach these, break them, uh, and no one ever gets prosecuted. You know, the... Um it's just incredible how the system protects the system. I think there was a, a famous case. I wouldn't. I don't know if many people would necessarily categorise it as famous, but it was a very interesting case, and it was between Bob Clarkson and Winston Peters. Yeah. And it, but I, I think that was between wasn't wasn't brought about because of any parliamentary action. I think that was between the parties themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, you're you're right. Nothing particularly much ever happens. I've seen some amazing breaches by the Greens and it just sort of, they sort of um, address it quietly and it all gets smoothed over and there's no raising of, of um, any matters in the media and and life goes on. But it's it's incredible what happens with people's egos d- during election time and uh, and we you know just you know, that well, whole minor party thing. Well, we're seeing that now, aren't we? With with a lot of the so called freedom parties, well, it's it's quite a good name, but they all purport to stand for rights and freedoms, but largely they're focused around one dynamic individual or someone with an ego that's pushing it, but there's there's no real depth there. And what your article is saying is, well, actually, guys, you need, actually need to think this through a lot more carefully. We can create all of these political groups, we can lobby and we can do all of these things and we can say that we stand for freedom, but if we're not going to get over the 5%, then you really need to think very carefully about what you're trying to achieve. So I try to impart some information around that and I and I tried to say to them look the best thing to do is for all of those parties that are going to go be voted back into parliament is to get them to all pledge um, that they will uphold rights and freedoms with no penalties for having those rights or freedoms that you um, and and to do it in such a way that every party pledges to support that um, and and I think that's a far better way to get that outcome, that commitment from the political parties that are successful than trying to create one that's actually going to not get above the 5% threshold and in actual fact put potentially Labour back in with the Greens and the Maori Party, which to me would be everybody's nightmare. Yeah, we have this um, discussion constantly coming up on Reality Check Radio about it. And we need to give somebody a voice. We need to talk about this. We need to get out there and get all this. And I say to people now when they send me emails, and, and I get this constantly when I'm giving advice to people, they say, oh, should we set up our own political party? And I say, are you mad? Are you absolutely mad? And they say, why? And I said, well, have you ever looked at how many parties have been created in New Zealand that have never held a seat or been represented in Parliament? And they say no. And I say to them, well, the number's 85. There's 85 parties that have never held a seat or been represented in Parliament, and 52 of those are since the advent of MMP, the very system that was supposed to allow smaller parties to come to the fore. So we've got a majority of parties formed in order to contest an election and to get into Parliament, and they get nowhere. But there's an additional 24 parties that have only ever had an MP for one term, uh, and generally they've only been formed when a sitting MP has decided to leave the party they're in and create this new party for the election, and then promptly at the next election they get wiped out. So it is one of the hardest things to do in New Zealand politics is to A, start a party, and B, create some longevity so that you can actually make meaningful changes to society because that's after all why you want to be an MP in the first place. 
Well, I think if people were watching the political landscape for a number of years, I think that they would see that ACT has actually achieved that. They went in on the basis of winning one seat. And so yeah. people are, are far too ambitious and start off um, probably with, with too big a game plan. And so if you just keep your focus tight, and the, I think you've got a better chance of success, but you need to actually negotiate with the existing major parties to be able to do that. Part, part of that too is that you've got to be prepared to be in it for the long haul. Mm. This is not a short-run game. And so I'm rather envious of um, the Dutch, uh, I think it's the Netherlands or Dutch, that, that um, can now actually have a rural party as a part of their parliament. Yeah. And and I think we are in desperate need for our our food producers to have representation in Parliament because um, so those people sitting around the table from all sides of the house they don't have a, a decent enough understanding and appreciation. I have to say I am impressed with Todd McClay um, mm. with his handling so far, and I think it's been pretty good. But um, we do need good, strong representation for our food producers. That's across the board, and I'm dismayed to see the way it's going. And and that's where I'm concerned around the climate change positions that political parties have taken. Um, I think in terms of agri agriculture, food producers, they should be left alone. We've got the best food producers in the world and and we're doing ourselves a disservice, the country a disservice, and the, and the food producers a disservice, a disservice by the way we're treating them. Is this problem come about because the two major parties have morphed over time where, you know, you used to have Labour as the party of the workers, uh, you know, represented the unions, still do in some respects, but have largely become uh, a party of woke urban liberals? And, and on, a I'm, few hang-ons from Maori, and then you look at the National Party, and the National Party's gone from being a rural-based party that, was you know always laughed at at being the rural rump of New Zealand, but have become increasingly urbanised and woke as well. I don't disagree with that, and that's a concern. Mm. And and I I um I just wish they'd pay closer attention to the legislative side of what's happening in the Parliament and give us a better quality of law because that's certainly not what's mm. happening and. I think the integrity of our law is being undermined to the worst extent by the current government. And there are legislative guidelines there and regulatory guidelines. Um, I'm disappointed that being watered down somewhat, um, but I think they should be compulsory in terms of, of the basics that existed prior to this current government. So the last time the legislative guidelines were changed was in 2018. Um, no, 2021, uh, 2018, but anyway, it was by Labour, so <clears throat> <Well>, not good. <laughs> <clears throat> no, and we saw we saw during the pandemic that they broke the law repeatedly for no consequences, which is exactly what we were talking about earlier. You know, yeah. They, they breached the Bill of Rights Act multiple times. The judges uh, went along with it. They went along to get along. Uh, no one held them to account. The media didn't. You know, it was me uh, and Barry Soper that uh, released the information that showed that the first lockdown was illegal and it was a private citizen who sued the government um, to hold them to account and got a declaration that it was illegal. And then subsequently there was further uh, breaches of the law uh, during the pandemic, which was all swept under the carpet. And you, you've got to ask yourself, why are we surprised that people are running amok in our cities with and towns with violence and crime when they see that the people in charge uh, don't ever get punished for breaking the law? And they think a register of firearms is going to change that. I mean, talk about tinkering around the edges and, and fiddling while Rome burns. You know, it's just ludicrous the, the way in which they're functioning right now. And um, so I, I'm... I'm not in favour of the registry. The, the whole firearms debacle has been consistently a debacle under this current government. Well, I wouldn't think National would be any different, sadly. Well, 
and that that's to my mind a bit of a shame. I think they need to start getting into a bit of rational thinking instead of thinking about um, with with a view to to whether or not they're popular. A little bit more rational thinking is required. Um, I'm very impressed with Stephen Joyce's um, interviews recently on on um, different media. Yeah, and. Um, it's a, it's a shame he's left Parliament because he he was a, a real thinker about things, a, a thinker, but actually also a doer, mm. and um, he tried to cut to the chase. Which um, and and you don't always make friends along the way because you can't always keep placa- placating all the egos around you. So people see that as as potentially a bit standoffish and don't warm to it. But I think people need to be looking at. Um, the bang they get for their buck. And for Steve and Joyce, it's considerable. If we just go back to the you know, gun laws and things like that, we had a government that had a knee-jerk reaction to a single event by an, an imported terrorist. Then they claimed that they'd taken 40,000 guns off the street in the buyback. And I think that's the number that they've, they've settled on. Well, that's not very many guns considering when you – uh, look at the number of licensed firearms owners there are. There's you know, over 250,000 of us, and so they're saying that they got less than uh, less than a quarter of guns back off firearms owners. And then since then, we've got had a, a proliferation of gun crime in New Zealand with increased murders, uh, shootings, especially in Auckland, seemingly on a daily basis. It was wrong-footed then. It's wrong-footed now, and the gun register they say is now going to going to end, uh, you know, make it harder for criminals to get guns. And I and I've never they've never shown us the working on this. It's a joke. The whole thing's a joke. They have no idea how many illegal guns are out there. They have no, have no idea how many guns that the criminal sector actually has, and it could be more than the number of the registered or illegal firearms owners. So the whole thing's a joke, an absolute joke. And so they're so busy trying to um, bring to task the honest bloke, Sheila, whatever, whoever owns a gun, the honest person that tries to do always do the right thing, they want, they're wanting to penalise them and pin them against the wall while the crims are getting away with it hand over fist. They have no idea what the illegal firearms are that exist out there. Well, I had this exact discussion with Mike McElraith about it, and I said, oh, you've got no idea what's happening out there. All these laws are doing is penalising people like me. He goes, oh, well, you know, it's it's a responsible thing to do. I said, that's the same argument they use for vaccines, and it turned out we were right about that. When are you going to actually listen to the owner's community and start focusing on taking guns off criminals? Because you're just making, he said, oh, well, you know, gun owners are the ones that are giving criminals guns. And I said, that's just total rubbish. It so, might be it, might be one or two people that do that, but it's not, not, you know, it's not widespread. And in any respect, having a gun register, and I said this to Mark Mitchell as well last week when I, when I was talking to him about it, and I said, you're thinking that you're going to stop people selling guns to criminals. It's not going to happen. All the all you've done is increase the risk to the person who's selling the gun to the criminal, and all he's going to do is put a market solution to that, which means that instead of a thousand dollars for selling that gun to that criminal, it's now five thousand dollars selling that gun, and then I'll run the risk that I'll I'll might get picked up by a vigilant police force, and if I do, well, the judges will probably give me a slap on the wrist with a wet bus ticket anyway. And so all you've done is make the, the price of illegal firearms more expensive, which for criminals they don't care because they've got their money from their drug sales and they've got plenty of that. So what's their objective? Is the objective is Control. they think that they're gonna they're gonna hold hold all the the honest law abiding citizens up against the wall to catch these criminals um and the exchange of guns or the selling of guns from the law abiding citizen, it just ain't <laughs> gonna happen. But, I mean, they, they have all sorts of ways of getting these guns if, in terms of the criminal element. Um, so I, I just think they need to identify and be very clear about what their objective is and how they intend to go about achieving it. And a registry of, of honest citizens is not the way to do it. 
it's a shopping list in the end, and we've seen an appalling data breach already of the new register. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hundred hundred and fifty two um, firearms owners in Auckland had their personal details broadcast via email all around the place. God knows where it ended up. Um, I, but- I honestly, if I was one of those gun owners. I'd be absolutely screaming because that puts them at risk. You know, people who own firearms and collect firearms, their biggest uh, security uh, is anonymity. That's people, right. People not knowing. You know, like I had a, a mate of mine the other day who's a collector, and um, he um, tipped up at home, and there was a police car outside his house and policeman outside his door. And he said, well, what are you doing here? He says, oh, we've come to do this. So well, now you've just told all my neighbours that I'm a person of interest. You know, <laughs> you now know, now my all my neighbours know that the, the police are here for some reason. You know, if you're dealing with firearms, come in an unmarked car. Come come as an ordinary person. And in person. civvies, must yeah. do, not but a they uniform. Don't. They t- and oh. I had the same thing. I had two guys tip up at my house and say, oh, we're here to inspect your safe. And I said, oh, well, that's a shame. And they said, why is that? And I said, because you haven't made an appointment and I'm busy. And you have to make an appointment. By law, you have to give me seven days' notice. And you haven't done that, so I can't do it. As I said, I'm busy. And they said, well, what are you busy doing? I said, I'm talking to two idiots who don't understand the law. Wow. (laughs) I'm I'm prepared to stand up to them, but it's like you are prepared to stand up to the media, to stand up to Chris Hipkins, to stand up to Gary Gottlieb, you know, um, when he laid complaints. You stood up to these people. But how many people don't stand up? And that's how our rights and freedoms be, uh, are eroded because we don't stand up to to those in authority who are exceeding their authority. Yeah, and, and I, I don't disagree with that, Cam, um, and I will do that every time, but Unfortunately, there are people, a lot of people that can't do that. They don't know how to do that. Um, they feel intimidated and threatened, and so they will go along with things. And, and I think that's the sadness of it. And so it comes back to us relying on our political representatives. That's why this year is so critical, and that's why I put out that article around the um, giveaway vote. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's really important. It's what I've been trying to do with this with this radio show. Uh, to educate uh, voters on how they can make their vote count. And that's the most important thing, because if you vote for, as you say, with these giveaway votes, if you vote for a party that is not going to make it into parliament, you might feel morally superior that you voted according to your conscience, or you might feel vindicated that maybe they got 2%, and you know if they just try harder next time, they could get in. But you have to look at a lot of these parties and the people that are leading them and say to them, well, you know, come on, let's deal with reality here. And that's the reason why Reality Check Radio, uh, you know, invested in a poll in Northland because there was a lot of claims from Shane Jones, from Matt King, from uh, other candidates that they were leading and they were going to win. And so we tested that by, by putting our money where our mouth is and doing a poll. And it showed that, that that wasn't the case, that essentially a donkey with a blue ribbon is going to win that seat. It, it didn't matter. You, you could change the donkey to a sheep or, or, or a guard dog, but put a blue rosette on and it's going to win that seat at the next election. And all the wishful thinking and what I call hopium uh, isn't going to get the, the, them across the line. And if that's their strategy, we're going to win this seat, then that's a strategy that's flawed from the get-go, and therefore the votes that are going to go in that direction will end up, as you're saying, as a giveaway vote and handed largely on on about a 50-50 split between the Labour Party and the National Party, and I'm not sure a freedom voter wants that to happen. And and this is where I think it's still not a lost opportunity. The freedom voters still have an opportunity to challenge all of those parties that will make the 5% threshold to challenge them to uphold rights and freedoms with no pe- penalty. Yeah, uphold rights and freedoms. And if and if you don't do that, if you won't sign up to that, then 
then what what we'll do is we'll we'll say to all the people who support us and, and believe in rights and freedoms that these politicians they do support that and that's where you should um, pour your votes into, rather than a shotgun approach. I mean, I mean let's be frank. Some of the of the parties that are out there are, are led by people who have never won anything. Um, even some of them have stood for parliament six times, six or seven times, and not won anything and have got you know less votes if you take uh, Brian Tamaki for example right and it doesn't matter whether you agree with him or disagree you just look at the numbers uh, any party that's been associated with him in the past has got less votes than the people number of people in the congregation of his church so not even his own followers support him when it comes to politics right okay well <laughs> so- one of the things i've been i've been approached by a number of smaller parties, people mm. that, that have been wanting to create um, political parties for this year's election. Yeah. And um, I, I actually had to send one of them a text and I said, don't let your ego get in the way of rational thought. <laughs> so, um, Because th- they don't understand how hard it is to actually get a political party over the line. And as I said, ACT was able to achieve that right at the beginning by at least winning a seat. Yeah. And and they've actually grown on that, but it's taken a long time for them to grow that. Well, New Zealand First has taken 30 years and they've waxed and waned, just like the ACT Party, they've waxed and waned. Sometimes they have one MP, sometimes they have none. Um, That's right. But it's, it, it, you're right, it's a very, very long and involved process. And ultimately the system uh, grinds you down because you, unless you can become a major party uh, and supersede Labour and National in that regard, then you're always going to be fleas on a dog's tail. Uh, and there's very little that you can actually achieve. And so you can make all sorts of promises that you like. But ultimately, if you don't get into Parliament and don't get into a position where you're in, it can form a coalition. And, and that's the position that matters. Because you can have a principal position all you like, but unless you're actually in a coalition to govern, you can't affect any of the changes that you may want to have. I think, though, you have to, you may not be able to do that in your first term, but I think if you, you build on your integrity and you build on a good work ethic within the parliament, and that means focusing on good law mm. and good outcomes of the law for the people of the country, then I think you've got a chance. But you have to have you have to have pretty strong work ethic and commitment to do that. And you've got to really love it. And and you have to have a strategy that's yeah. more than three years you know, a three year time frame. And that's the problem with the electoral cycle, is you get caught into this electoral cycle. Um you, you let's say you get one seat and then you spend all your time defending that one seat instead of focusing on, you know, expanding out from there. It's really hard. And, you know, I've been involved in politics all my life. And, you know, that is the single hardest thing to do is to go out and start a new party. And, you know, I admire Winston Peters um, for doing that. I admire, um, you know, Roger Douglas for starting the ACT Party and getting that going because they said that they had some ideas that they wanted to share with New Zealand. Uh, and then they stood on those ideas and then they got themselves elected. Another person who did that was Tariana Turia. I've got immense respect for Tariana Turia because she left the Labour Party, or she says they left her, and she's probably right. Uh, but she left the Labour Party, and then she she went the extra yard that you don't often see with politicians when they leave their parties. She actually resigned from Parliament and then tested it immediately in a by-election and won. You You have to have immense respect for people who do that. They're showing... That they can walk the t- they can they can walk the talk, and all too often we see politicians put aside their personal convictions, put aside their their personal beliefs just to chase you know the random passing vote. And I have utter disdain for politicians that are like that. Right. Well, can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I've got no thoughts on that. Yes, you I do. Mean- you do have thoughts on that, Sandra, because. You are a conviction politician. When you knew something was right in your own heart, you said, no, 
I'm not going to do what everyone else is doing. Right? You saw your local community in Wangamata wanted their uh, mangroves gone. You backed them. Oh, yeah. No, that, right. that would be true. And I, I remember being um, visiting visiting uh, the, uh, some people in the States, United States, and and um, this this person was a uh, um, one of the senior managers from a television company. Anyway, and this was in Los Angeles. And anyway, we stayed with them overnight and lovely people. And he said to me, what was your greatest achievement after nine years in Parliament? And and I said to I said to him without thinking I said to him I came out with a clear conscience, <laughs> and and he said wow I've never heard that before, <laughs> which and and but it's always been important for me, even as a mayor, and I was one of either the only vote or the only one of two votes that um, voted for something and the rest of them voted against against it against myself and the other person. Um, I, I stuck to what I believed was the right thing. Yeah. So, and that that is important to me. So, if you can hear that knocking, it's the grandson at the door. <laughs> <laughs> He's all right though. He, he sounds like he gets his own way. Mum's out there. Oh, he's a wee honey. <laughs> aren't, they, aren't they all though? You know. Uh, he's got a he's got a he's got a fist on him, hasn't he? Oh, he has. He's um. I, I mean, I've seen. I saw him fall off the couch when he's when he's two, right? Yeah. I saw him fall on the couch, twist in the air, and land on his feet, land he's on part, his fours. He's you know, part, his hands he's part feet. cat. He's part cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so uh, yeah, we've, this election is. I've been saying this election is one of the most important that we've that we've had in. In my lifetime, actually, you know, I've heard lots of things. It's vitally important, 1990, vitally important to get rid of the Labour Party. Um, You know, we had Helen Clark saying vitally important to get rid of the National Party. But I actually think this election is is way more important than all of those before that have gone before us because of the freedoms and the rights that we have uh, that are eroding and being uh, destroyed by the current crop politicians. And and I and I. It- Brings to mind some things that, uh, some phrases I've got in my head like "in hot" to "black rock." You know, you can expect your electricity prices to quadruple if they if they have any any hand in what's happening with the, with New Zealand. I don't like um, the climate change policy of National, um, and, and I think that's going down the wrong path. Mm. Um, I, I think we need to get back to basics here in New Zealand, but you know it's it, you know that's otherwise the I'm pretty okay with most of what's what's being presented by National and Act, um, mm. and uh, what's coming through from New Zealand first as well. Um, but definitely, I, I just think the Greens have actually lost the plot. I think they've lost their way and lost the principles that they first used to gamble on, and um, and I think Marama Davidson is a big part of the reason for that. I, I just think New Zealand needs to come back to um, back to the future, really. They need to be a bit more focused. And, and we're dissipating our energies and spreading our wealth where we can't afford it. Well, we, what we're doing is essentially economic sabotage. We've got... Yeah, uh, you know, amazing resources in in our society. You're from the Coromandel. We've got gold um, in the hills there. There's plenty of gold still there in those hills. Um, you know, we've got massive coal reserves uh, that we can use. We've got oil. We've got gas. We could be energy self sufficient. Yet, amazingly, we're stopping people from extracting those resources, and worse, we're importing. You know, foreign coal and foreign oil, and all of those things, and and we're beggaring ourselves in the process. And now we've got a bunch of hypocrites called BlackRock that have been invited in to have some climate investment. When ninety six percent or some huge number of their investments are in fossil fuels and everything else, now they're just in it to make money, and they can see a bunch of gullible Kiwis that are saying, "Well, let's put our money into these." fanciful ideas of wind turbines and all of that sort of stuff, uh, none of which are proven uh, to supply anywhere near the sustainable energy that they claim. 
And and that's the thing that annoys me the most about politicians. You know, we've had electricity reforms, health sector reforms, where all the politicians said um, that it was going to be motherhood and apple pie and it's going to be wonderful and save us all a lot of money. And all it creates is a whole lot of hoo-ha and cost. And now we're doing it all again, um, this time with co-governance, uh, with another restructure of the health system to fix the last restructure that fixed the one before that and the one before that. You know, Max Bradford's electricity reforms, I can't say he had improved the situation, but no one holds these politicians to account. No one says, you, you promised us the earth and you delivered us a piece of dirt. And yet Muldoon did the think big, and where would we be without those big power hydro schemes right now? Well, where would the Greens be who were opposed to all of those, building dams and all of those sorts of things and Motunui and Everyone, Labour Party opposed everything that Muldoon did. Criticise him all you like for being the world's biggest socialist, but he actually built things, and they're That's things right. that we use today. And what have we done in recent years? We've torn things down. We've we've annihilated New Plymouth, and we've annihilated Marston Point, which are, are both tragic because they're essential for what they're providing and what they could have provided into the future. And so no wonder our roads are our third world. I mean, you can't, no point in buying anything but a four wheel drive these days. <laughs> the SUV, ironically, um, they don't make too many of those electric. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want one. I've no. gone, I've gone petrol myself and, and, um, with a retro Prado, yep. three door, love it. Goes and everywhere. They can it? Stick their bloody electrics right, right where, well, I better not say much more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you're certainly a plain-speaking politician, and uh, I think the world needs more people like you, Sandra, and uh, you need to be more outspoken. And uh, Look, I'd love to have you back on the show um, multiple times. Whenever you feel like um, spouting off on something with your truth bombs, uh, you're welcome to come on the crunch with me. Right. Well, thank you very much, Cam. It's been fun. We appreciate it. <laughs> thank you very much, Sandra. She's a brave lady and a person of strong convictions. We've learned that Sandra Gowdy does not back down. She's one of our people. She makes a very good point that we all need to be aware of how the wasted vote is reallocated so that we don't end up gifting those we don't support with any extra boost. Don't forget to send comments on Sandra's interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR.